Dear students, let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is 11th May 2016. Yesterday the UPSC results are declared. We did extremely well in the UPSC results and uh, that is the reason why I mean all around with the students I was unable to do the video yesterday. So that's the reason in the morning I am doing this video. Now remember I understood only one thing in this entire exam. The more simple you are in your presentation, the greater are the chances to be successful. Yes, there is an element of unpredictability in this exam. But one thing is certain, if you don't work, you will never be successful. If you work and try to introspect and improve, there is a good chance that you will be successful. That is the rule number one. And the second thing is, as I see the students, most of the students, they are losing the motivation just before the examination. Now, generally, the students who go for coaching, they take it in two seasons. One is in June-July season. The other one is in October-November season. This October-November season students, they are mostly in a dilemma to give their attempt or not. And the second thing is, for them, confidence is a major challenge. The reason is, by the time their syllabus is finished, they are just before the gates of the examination. So they think that they did not prepare well for this exam. So try to leave these misconceptions away. Along with your classes, read the class notes once. Do your NCERT perfectly, economic survey, and India yearbook. And just get into the exam, you will come out with flying colors. Last year, everyone thought um, the paper is uh, quite easy, but uh, yesterday UPSC has re released its cutoff marks. If you think cutoff is somewhere around 120, 130, that is foolishness. The cutoff for general category it is around 107.34. The 107.34 it means it is around 54 percent, less than 54 percent. So, even an easy paper, if you get 54%, you can clear this exam colorfully, the prelims colorfully. So, the next thing is mains. Many of you think that mains is, is something which has to be balanced, etc. There, the necessary marks required are less than 50%. So, a pla appropriate planning, simplicity in your presentation, clarity in your thought, these three things will make a big difference for this exam, right? So, I'm sorry for the delay. And uh, re I have got the answer scripts of all the people who got selected from my side this year. Over a period of time, I wanted to share those answer sheets too through the civil spread. If you observe those answer sheets, one thing is very clear, especially I'll take the example of Snehaja. Her beauty is in her presentation. The, she unnoticingly exceeds the word limit. But her speed of writing is so fast. She is able to complete the paper. That is one thing. But however, she always got the highest mark in essay. The reason is her essay is more like a free-flowing talk. And the second is, if you take the GS, so she presents answer as she is discussing with you in such a simple language. Don't try to write some Shakespeare in English or something else. Just maintain it as, as simple as possible. Right, let us start the discussion. Now, welfare, freebies and prohibition. Now, in the context of the Tamil Nadu elections, the DMK and AIDMK, even PMK, everyone have announced the freebies. So, in this context, how the freebies are going to affect the development, and welfare, how the definition of the welfare itself is changing, so these things we try to understand. These freebies are criticized by both left and right. Why the left is criticizing the freebies? So left believes that it is going to depoliticize the people. Because for the politicization of the people, people shall have the urge to fight the government and its mistakes. But this is more of a kind of give and take between the people and the government for voting in favor of a particular, government, particular party 
in the government with governmental money at a later date they are providing for the freebies and the second is the corruption in the government the people also become a bit relaxed or they will not take very serious about the corruption in the government it will undermine the accountability of the government coming to the rightish side the rightish side sees it is not right it is not correct to give something for free for the people not only from fiscal direction it is also from the other element of hard work so if everything is given for free the element of hard work will be lost from the free people so in this context what the author argues now in a pure capitalistic sense most of the european countries produced the surplus through hard work and efficiency in this case they transformed from agricultural to industrial to the services sector so there is a transformation of the industry and also the labor force from one to the other but unlike this in india there is no particular transformation as which is occurred as like in the capitalistic industry our industry is neither improved the efficiency nor transformed itself into a capitalistic manner completely so in this case post 1991 after liberalization the economic opportunities for the poor are decreasing that is the first thing and the second is the governmental stim or also policy discretion is also slowing down due to market forces so to influence the people and their behavior so government is more and more resorting to the freebies it also has electoral fervor and added to that the wealth is getting accumulated in few hands few to jobless growth many of the people are left out of from this particular wealth so they are unable to be the participants of the growth process so in this case they fa- they are also failing to claim the benefits of the growth process so that's why so few people who have the opportunities they are accumulating the wealth so making the people in the as the participants in the growth process governments are seeing them to be the participants with regard to the gains of the distribution process so this from this dimension also we can see the freebies but on freebies generally for the upsc examination you shall see it in a negative dimension itself now coming to the playing nanny our indian constitution is based on the separation of powers so what is this separation of powers here so you have executive legislature and judiciary performing three different functions now if you take the uttarakhand issue the judiciary hand holding of the legislative process which has to be concluded within the authority of the speaker in the house is like infringement of the judiciary into the legislature function because of this legislature in the long term will lose its credibility and on the other hand it itself is the failure of the legislature to solve the problem by itself so one way the judiciary's role is expected to solve the constitutional crisis but on the other way the judiciary coming into the legislature sphere will expose the legislature failures and the representatives the confidence of the people in the representatives is going to come down which is not good for the democracy and the second is with carrots as sticks it is related to the media now if you take media in india they are their major revenue sources from the governmental advertisement now the government started using this advertisement as a tool to influence the media reporting the supreme court in the common cause versus union of india case clearly objected to this and the second is the number of newspapers news channels have increased in india but the diversity of reporting and challenging of the ideas did not move forward it means newspapers are increasing but all of them are talking about the same thing so it means whenever the news i mean uh, newspapers are increasing the multiplicity of the ideas have to be put forward there shall need to a debate in the government influence the policy all this role we describe it as a policy advocacy role of media so the media is sh- the reporting is shrinking but media as an economic space is increasing which is not a good sign coming to the miscounting of the poor recently rangarajan's article if you take 
As of now, we are taking only the private consumption of the people to define the poor. But if you carefully observe, uh, they say, so let us also include the public expenditure made on the poor. So public expenditure plus private consumption, these together will make the difference. That's what it has been said. So miscounting the poor, it may, uh, uh, this tries to question that particular Rangarajan's article saying that um, we are always counting the difference where the government is unable to feed the essential goods that is being fed by themselves, by the poor people. That's why it will not add any value. That's what is the author is arguing about. Now coming to the Geospatial Information Bill 2016, the draft which was introduced by the Ministry of Home Affairs. According to this, any depiction, dissemination or anything related to the geospatial information uh, authority will be appointed and there has to be a permission from this authority. If it is wrongly depicted a penalty of um, 100 crore can be imposed on that uh, uh, individual or entity if it wrongly depicts the Indian boundaries. Now, if you take the Israel example where the sensitive establishments will not be shown in the Google Maps. The same is the case with United States of America. But in India, these multinational companies are also showing the sensitive establishments such as uh, Bark, etc. So in this case, the government want to regulate this uh, map in uh, agencies uh, or private agencies in the, in the interest of the national security. But however, it shall not lead to a overkill. How? If you carefully observe with regard to this, uh, and uh, if... A separate institution is established and if it has to give the permissions, the data is so large and the geospatial information is so complex. The handling of this situation needs huge manpower and also the critical knowledge. So obviously it is going to lead to delay and delay which is going to wipe out our development and innovation according to yesterday's Hindu paper. So unnecessary red tapeism is the result out of it. After the red tapeism, the next challenge is this. If we are trying to improve this, for example, the already Indian agencies such as National um, Statistical Organization and also various policies that are existing, the policies means National Geospatial Policy, National Map Policy, so with this, it is not able to uh, associate with. Now the national map policy it has given two series of the maps. One is uh, the defense series and open series. The open series is already publicly available, but the resolution of these maps is one is to one million. So as of now, the Google and all these are using a maps of one is to five thousand. So in this context. Uh, so we need to improve the quality of the maps provided by the governmental agencies before we take forward the regulation. And National Geospatial Policy of the Science and Technology states that there has to be a open sharing of information related to the geospatial aspects. And third thing is, as like the data in the last decade or in this decade, now the geospatial information is also becoming a new value. Added to that, the, how the spectrum was useful to us and how it has given the rich dividends to the Indian economy, the geospatial information is also expected to give the rich dividends to the Indian economy. So it has an economic value too. So the government shall try to realize this economic value too. These are the various suggestions which are been given over here. Now coming to the governance and infrastructure. So with regard to infrastructure, now, the one thing with regard to e-governance I wanted to talk about is this. The World Bank has given its World Development Report, which is related to the digitization. That is, World Development Report 2016, Digital Dividends is the article. So, in this report, what the World Bank says is, India still has a huge digital gap, digital penetration. A gap. So if you take the China, 
it has around 49% of the digital penetration. India has only 18% as of now. So as globally, or globally if you observe it is around 40% is the average. India is much less than the global average. So if tomorrow, as I discussed to you, the digital divide will reflect as data divide. And this data divide will reflect as opportunity divide. Will ultimately transform as developmental divide. So the socio-economic development will get hampered if we do not properly take this forward. Now coming to this article, Asian Development Bank, it is financing various projects, road projects in India and the South Asia as a whole. Now with regard to the road projects, the Bangladesh, India, Bhutan, Nepal, connectivity through the chicken neck corridor and similarly Myanmar connectivity through Manipur and also in Myanmar the transmission lines Tapi pipeline and uh, further is East economic East Coast Economic Corridor of India so where Vishakapatnam Chennai uh, industrial corridor lies all these projects are being supported by the Asian Development Bank and coming to the digital convergence so with regard to this under Universal Services Obligation Fund every supplier has to keep some money into this fund to provide for the services to the remotest corners of the country so based on this the telecom ministry it is going to provide the connectivity undersea connectivity to the Andamar Nicobar and the Lakshwadweep islands now coming to Suresh Prabhu's article now railways if it has to be developed the investments are very critical and also movement financial movement is also important so if you observe for the last decade almost there is no rise in the prices of the uh, railway tariff. So that's a burden, the subsidy which is given to the passengers, um, it was levied on the uh, uh, goods. That's why goods are becoming, goods transport is becoming extremely costly through railways. Uh. So in this case, uh, with regard to the railways, uh, we have the Chinese model and also we have the United States of America's model. So in Chinese model, the investments were given in the right time. And there is a huge use of the railways, Japanese model too. Because of that, they are financially also sustainable. Amtrak, in giving, uh, in the United States of America, the railway services are called Amtrak. In giving preference to the airlines, uh, so Amtrak was, uh, for investments were being uh, sidelined. So especially if you observe the Vanderbilt era in the United States, it is all the railroad era. But later railroad almost died in the United States due to lack of proper investments. And is far behind the Europe, Japan and China. So India if it has, shall not go in an Amtrak way, there are two things. There, is an there shall be an independent agency to determine the prices. And the second thing is... We shall make a free flow of investments in modernizing our railway sector. Now, uh, the Supreme Court cannot review speaker's actions. It is about money bill. So as per the constitution, the speaker is the final authority to certify a bill as a money bill. So, it was recently, Aadhaar bill is uh, certified as a money bill by the speaker. And to that extent, Rajya Sabha's role was curtailed. You all know that in a money bill, the Rajya Sabha has minimum role to play. So this is challenged by Mr. J. Ram Ramesh in Supreme Court. And the government argues that this cannot be, or this cannot be a, a question because the Supreme Court can't involve with the legislative affairs. Later, it's argued that the money bill, certifying a money bill, will automatically deprive the constitutional authority or function of another house that is Rajya Sabha. It cannot come under the, it, it has to, speaker's uh, discretion has to be controlled. The second is article 32 is also in discussion because the J. Ram Ramesh argued, so this is violation of the rule of law. 
So that's why he has entered to the Supreme Court under Article 32 of the Constitution. But government argues that if it is the case, any violation of the law every day we are seeing that can be gone as article under Article 32 to the Supreme Court through a writ petition. So it is not an appropriate argument to file a writ petition. That's what is the government argument is. Now coming to the internet governance. Recently we are seeing multi-stakeholder participation. So what is this multi-stakeholder participation over here? It means that Different agencies have to come together, that is, um, uh, the, the NGOs, that is civil society, the global multinational corporations and government all will together make a decision with regard to the various uh, international issues. So in the internet governance, um, this particular multi-stakeholder governance is very much spoken about. Recently, the Jack Ma, he is the chief of Alibaba. He said that uh, the world shall have a common e-governance policy as like WTO directing the trade in the goods and services physically on the online space for the trade and governance we need to have a, a e-marketing policy so which has to be facilitated through the involvement of the business, civil society and the governments. So it is seen as a more an attempt towards undermining the governmental role and increasing the business role in influencing the policies of the various independent sovereign nations. That is what is the essence. Now coming to the bicameral balance. Last year a committee is also appointed on this particular matter. And it has clearly said that every state shall have a upper house. Because this upper house provides for an intrusive arals understanding and intelligent understanding and it reduces the heat on the matters which are being discussed in the lower house but however if you observe the state level the upper house is more a second house rather than sorry more a secondary house rather than a second house it has neither impact on the money bill nor on the ordinary bill so it can just discuss the matters but it has no proper role mentioned in the constitution so, the major function uh, of this um, is to provide for a political employment to the people who are unable to win the elections through a direct route. But historically, if you observe, Anna Durai and then uh, C. Rajagopalachari, all these have become the chief ministers by entering the legislature through the legislative council. So, it was highly criticized at that point of time, the chief minister who has to be the head of the government coming through the indirect route to the uh, chief ministerial position. But of all this, um, the committee said that, um, yes, there has to be a uniform policy throughout the country to provide for the legislative councils because in Tamil Nadu, when DMK comes up, it tries to propose for that legislative council. When AI DMK comes into power, it passes a resolution for the dissolution of the Legislative Council. So the Legislative Council's existence shall not be the discretion of the government of the day. A uniform policy shall exist to maintain the respect of the House. That is what is the committee discussed about. So these are the articles for today. So I will upload the 12th paper today. Sorry for the delay. Now sorry Civil Sprub. Thank you very much.